Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Welcome to our continuing discussion of 30 keys to understanding the meaning of the Quran. Today we're dealing with key number 23, which is understanding the tendencies of classical commentaries. Why do we need to do that? Well, we need to know because uh, a lot of the commentaries, like what we think to be Quran, uh, is really the meaning that has been bandied down to us through, you know, classical commentaries, one copying from another, till it's become so commonplace that when Muslims think of the verse of the Quran, they think of the commentary. When they think of the commentary, they think of the verse. So to, to, to like in the Muslim mind, the two may become so interwoven that uh, one cannot distinguish one from the other. Sometimes it takes uh, a scholar to go sit down and break the two apart to say, okay, this is the uh, text and this is the commentary. The two are separate and let's recognize how separate they are. The classical commentaries, on the other hand, uh, they uh, tended to uh, do two things that are of note here. One is that uh, they tended to take um, the narratives of what was said before as, uh, as being like authentic. This is the meaning of the Quran. They tended to be mostly hadith-based or tradition-based. That means that somebody said it, uh, either uh, most importantly the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or his com companions. But uh, they, the, the logic of taking what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, explain is that, as we said in the previous key, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is the prime commentator. God revealed the Quran to him in order to explain the Quran to us. So it'd be great to have a hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him, explaining what the Quranic verse means. However, we have so few narratives from the Prophet peace be upon him that the tendency has been more to take from other later sources. One has a reason to go to the companions of the Prophet peace be upon him. You say the companions uh, of the Prophet lived and walked with the Prophet peace be upon him. They were the earliest Muslims. They were there when the Quran was being revealed. They understood the circumstances and so on. They knew the Arabic language as it was at the time of the Quranic revelation. And so many good reasons from for taking the meanings as expressed by the companions companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. But then as you go from one generation to another, it gets watered down. Less and less good reasons for taking from the Tabi'in, the followers of the companion, and then from the Tabi'a Tabi'in, and so on, the followers of the followers. But the classical commentator, t commentators on the Quran wanted to get some uh, narrative that seals the deal for us, so we don't have to think any further. They even came to the uh, conclusion largely that to use reason in Revelation, no, this is... Uh, you know, taboo. So we can't use reason. We must get it by a transmission. It must be transmitted by somebody else, from, from somebody else to us. And then we just receive the knowledge and we just, we, then we just relay it. We just pass it on to somebody else later on to our readers of the uh, Tafsir tradition. So they, they, they saw that there is a text uh, a, a, on the one hand and there is reason on the other hand and they don't apply the reason. They even uh, denounced uh, reason to a certain extent. I mean, this is largely uh, the tendency but of course there are variations on this theme. So we'll come to the variations by looking at some particular examples. They denounced the use of ra'i or op op opinion. Uh, no, you can't offer opinion in tafsir. You must just simply take the tradition as it was. And that's the one tendency that they wanted to just simply uh, you can say regurgitate what was said uh, before, regardless by whom almost, because naturally they wanted to give higher importance to if the Quran itself said, explained its meaning, and then what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, and then what the companion said, and then what the Tabi'in said, and then what the Tabi'a Tabi'in and so on said, they go in gradations. But in the end, like uh, they say, a drowning man clutches at a, at a straw. So they would clutch at anything just to get a tradition to explain explain the passage because they have already concluded that you can't use your opinion, your opinion is dangerous, this takes people away from the faith and so on. So they don't want to apply reason, so they took anything that they called uh, revelation. By doing that, uh, they lost sight of the fact that the earliest people that they're quoting from sometimes offered their opinion. Sometimes the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, offered their opinion. Sometimes the Tabi'in offered their opinion. They didn't have anything from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so they offered their opinion. If they had everything from the Prophet, peace be upon him, we wouldn't need every, any, ev everybody else. We wouldn't need the Sahaba, the Tabi'in, and Taba Tabi'in, and so on, because we have it straight from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Why would we take it from the lesser sources? But we took it from the lesser sources 
resources because we didn't have it from the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself. And when we see the logic of the whole enterprise, we realize that uh, it is uh, a failed logic because they did take opinions and report the opinions back to us as the meanings of the Quran while at the same time denouncing uh, the opinions and telling us that we cannot use opinion. Of course, we're not saying use every whimsical opinion about the Quran or, and just come up with a, you know, free thinking, okay, the Quran must mean this. No, we apply the principles, all of the keys that we uh, have said already and more to follow. But uh, we, we do that in a judicious manner, uh, in an academic uh, manner and trying to be justified in, in reaching conclusions, not just making the Quran mean what we want it to mean. This is a tendency in the class classical uh, tradition that we must recognize. So when somebody comes and puts a classical commentary in our faces and says, well, the Quran means this because look, it says here in a classical commentary, uh, we must be able to step back and say, well, wait a minute, where did the classical commentary get it from? It says that such and such a person in the Middle Ages said this. Well, how did that person in the Middle Ages knew, know that this is what the Quran meant? If the Quran itself was revealed some 700 years before this person that you're citing, how did that person know that this is what the Quran actually meant? This is what God meant. How does this person know the mind of God? So we need to ask that legitimate question. So that was the first thing to recognize about the classical commentators, that they tended to report the opinions of others without recognizing or at least highlighting that this is op opinions that we are reporting. At the same time, they insisted that everything must be based on a tradition. The second uh, tendency was they were copycats. They tended to copy what was there before. Now, of course, uh, this is a good thing in some way in that it, it shows a kind of fidelity to the tradition. They knew that uh, they, they're not going to invent anything in the, in the Word of God. They were just going to reproduce what was there before. So they tended to be uh, reproductive of the previous uh, commentaries. So you can almost see, you can take a commentary, put it side by side with the previous one, and you can say, okay, this later commentary almost word for word has repeated what was there in the previous commentary. Sometimes there's variation, sometimes there's the addition of something new, sometimes there's a little bit of fresh thinking, but mostly uh, it is just simply uh, reproductive like this. We need to recognize this as a tendency to realize that just because 10 different commentaries on the Quran says this, it doesn't mean that this is true. The 10 is just as good as the one, a little bit better, because we have later persons, re uh, you know, endorsing and ratifying, uh, restating what was said before means uh, they've accepted. So we have not one scholar accepting it, but a whole slew of scholars accepting the same thing. But if the thinking is not genuine, not original, not, not uh, you know, people are not thinking outside of the box. If you, you print something incorrect on a, on a page and you run, you know, a hundred copies uh, on a photocopier, then all of them will come out the same. But just because you have a hundred copies now doesn't mean that it's a better uh, truth than, than what was there in the original. If the original was false, then all of the copies will be false. So too, if an error has entered into the history of thinking about the meaning of the Quran, if an, enter, if an error was written in one of the books of Tafsir, then maybe later scholars recognize that as an error and, and omitted it from their commentaries. But uh, chances are that they didn't recognize it as an error and they continue to repeat the same thing. Such and such a great commentator before me said it, therefore it must be true. And here it is again. We have uh, errors repeated in tafsirs down through the centuries, one after another. And today we may see, okay, so many commentaries said it, it must be right. But no, it's not necessarily right because the many commentaries said it because these are not free thinkers all uh, freely arriving at the same conclusion. Uh, these are uh, copiers, basically copying the errors that were there before. And of course, all of the good things that were there before, we're grateful to all of these great commentators on the Quran, but we must recognize that these, these two tendencies so that we know how to interpret and understand the Quran uh, with the help of these commentaries to be sure, but also with uh, a little bit of uh, fresh thinking in order to be able to apply the Quran to our present and changing 
different circumstances, dealing with and responding to the real problems that are there before us. Now, I said that the tafsirs are not, not all of the same. Uh, those were some general trends, but we can see some variation in between. Tafsir Muqatil bin Sulaiman is good because this was written in the middle of the second century. is uh, the earliest tafsir that we have as a complete uh, work. And uh, uh, later on, tafsir al-Tabari. Uh, Tabari died in the year 310, so we're talking about the early 4th century. This is a massive commentary on the Quran, summarizing much of what was there said by way of commentary on the Quran before al-Imam al-Tabari. But Imam al-Tabari does some fresh thinking as well in that he evaluates these various opinions that he reports, and then he tells uh, us what is in his best judgment the right uh, opinion. Later on, we will find that Ibn Kathir is uh, largely based on uh, Tabari, repeating uh, almost verbatim much of what Tabari said, but tending more towards the traditional line, just simply repeating what was said uh, before. In the rational line, we have Azamakshari that I mentioned in the previous key, who was very much concerned with grammar and analyzing the Quran from scratch from the grammatical point of view. We have Al-Imam Ar-Razi, who applies a lot of fresh thinking to the Quran. He goes into very detailed analysis uh, on uh, what the Quran means and all, you know, if it means this, uh, it could mean one, two, three, four. And if it means one, then for one, there is a sub point and then, you know, sub points of sub points until sometimes the reader gets lost as to where exactly did we start off and we have to go back and reorient ourselves. But that shows a very deep level of thinking of Imam al-Razi. At the same time, Imam, Imam al-Razi was a, a Sunni and he tried to justify Sunni theology, especially vis-a-vis -vis the theology of the Mu'tazilis and especially the Qadaris, uh, whom I mentioned before in the previous key. He wanted to prove predestination uh, in contradistinction to those who said that human beings have the ability and the freedom, and therefore, based on that freedom, they will be, be judged. Mind you, Imam al-Razi and the rest of uh, Sunnis who insist on predestination will also insist that human beings have freedom and responsibility, and they will insist that the whole system is fair. It's just that the more they elaborate on it, the more you realize that what they're talking about is that every action is wholly and completely predetermined from A to Z, and there's nothing really that you can do about it to change it in any way. And you think that you're making good choices, but uh, the choices you're making also are part of the predetermined system. Nonetheless, uh, Al-Imam Razi's Tafsir is a very important and good one to read by those who want to apply a fresh uh, deal of thinking. Of course, uh, these Tafsirs are not available uh, to English uh, speakers, except for uh, the Tafsir of Imam uh, at Ibn Kathir. Uh, this has been translated, but uh, some of uh, the uh, parts have been eliminated in order to make a truncated, a summarized version, and the summarized version is published and available. So by reading the summarized version, we get some insight into what a traditional tafsir looks like, uh, but we're not getting the whole and pure thing. In contradistinction to this, a, a project has begun to translate the tafsir of al Imam al-Qurtubi. Uh, up to seven volumes have already been published of that uh, tafsir, but that's seven out of 30. Still, it's a massive uh, endeavor and an important work and here we're getting the full tafsir except some poetry which is hard to translate so when the commentator uh, cites a bit of poetry to prove something in the use of the Arabic language that part is left untranslated mostly in this uh, translation done by sister Aisha Buley but nonetheless it's a good work and uh, it is one that gives us an insight into how traditional tafsirs uh, work so I'll just close on this point by encouraging you to read uh, these classical commentaries but to recognize the tendencies that they have set out before us. So their tendency was on the one hand to rely on transmitted reports. They wanted to just report what was uh, said before. And in doing so, uh, they sometimes reported the, and repeated the mistakes of their predecessors. The second thing uh, was that uh, in, in their tafsir, they tended to um, just... Uh, um, uh, condemn the use of reason, but at the same time they were relying on a reason as as well, uh, without recognizing that this was a reason that they were relying upon. So by recognizing these tendencies in the tafsir, in the classical tradition, uh, we are better equipped to understand the Quran. While benefiting from these uh, books of tafsir and commentary, we are able now to step back and say, aha, that makes sense, or wait a minute, that's uh, there's something wrong in the logic of that. Let's go back and revisit it and study it some more. Join me again tomorrow when we will discuss another key, and that is understanding the tendencies in uh, translations
of the Quran in our modern era. Peace be with you and the mercy and blessings of God. Assalamu alaikum, Ramadan Mubarak from the Muslim Media Hub. I'm your brother in faith, Shabir Ali. This Ramadan, we're making history together. Behind me is the building you helped us purchase for the sake of Allah for the establishment of the Muslim Media Hub. Uh, we've started filming our television program here called Let the Quran Speak, and we're training the youth to produce other such shows and videos for social media uh, so that we can present the message of Islam to the wider world. Uh, this Ramadan, you can help us to raise $100,000 for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, please go to our website, muslimmediahub.com. May Allah bless you and all of your loved ones this Ramadan and forever. I'm your brother in faith, Shabir Ali, saying Assalamu Alaikum, peace be with you, and Ramadan Mubarak.